Hey, it's good to see you today. Glad you're here. I hope I didn't run over anybody coming down here. I was kind of late coming in this service, visiting with someone in the foyer. I'll tell you that I'm excited about the worship time today. Where some of you were in here when we rehearsed a few minutes ago, and we're singing a song that is kind of a, a student camp type song, and there's a part of it where you really get excited. And so I hope that this morning you're ready to worship. I know Hayden is, so if you need any help with it, Hayden's going to be right there. He'll show you how to do it and worship here in a few minutes. We're glad you're here. Now, if you look around the room, you see that we've got some space here, but not a whole lot of space. Quite a few people in the balcony today. One thing we've been encouraging people to do, listen, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're in this service. However, if you have some flexibility in your schedule, it would help us out if some maybe would worship at 8 o'clock or 9.15 so that we have room for others that come in the door, especially guests or those who may not know Jesus. So if you'd consider that, please don't think I'm saying we don't want you here. We want you here. We're glad you're here. But I know some of you may have that flexibility. All right? You guys just stay right where you are. You're good. Okay. <laughs> All right, you ready to worship today? We're going to begin by singing this morning. 
privilege of coming up out of the grave, the grave of sin and death, to a relationship with Jesus. Speaking of that, we're going to continue to worship with a testimony of baptism from Courtney Swilling. Have you trusted in Jesus for salvation? Yes. And do you commit to follow him as Lord? Yes. And it's because of your profession of faith that I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism. Yes. Amen. I love the focus here already this morning. Get our eyes focused on Jesus. Um, a lot of things in the world may be troubling us, a lot of things on our minds, whether it's our work, our personal lives, the situation in our country or the world. But I pray this morning that we're all able to put our eyes solely on Jesus and let those other things go for just a little bit anyway. Remember, we're in our sermon series in the book of Hebrews. Last week we looked at Hebrews 9, today is Hebrews 10. I want to read just a couple verses from Hebrews 9 to remind us where we are. Verses 13 and 14 says, Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. So that we can worship. Our salvation is not just so we can escape hell and go to heaven. It's not just so we can feel better about ourselves or have a better life here. It's all that. Yet it's so we can worship because we're entering into a relationship. Remember last week we talked about atonement. It's a made-up English word. at one In other words, in unity with Christ or reconciled with Christ because of what he did for us. And because of that, we have the privilege to worship. And when we sing about coming up out of the grave, we really mean it from our hearts. It's not just because we're part of a Christian club or have a tradition, but because we're celebrating a risen Savior and worshiping Him. So can we pray that way this morning? Let's pray that way this morning together. Father, this morning, we're thankful for a risen Savior. Father, I'm thankful that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, you came to earth. Not because we decided to be good people, not, beside, not, not because we wanted to try harder to be better, Father, but while we were yet sinners, you came to us and showed us our sin. Use the Old Testament, the words of the Old Testament, to, to show how we can never be perfect, how we'll always fall short of God's standard. And Father, once we realized our sin, you showed us that you made provision for it through Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection. And Father, because he came up out of that grave, you give us the privilege to also, just as it was demonstrated today in Courtney's baptism, Father, as if she went down into the grave and came back up. Father, we thank you for what you did for those of us who know you. Father, if there's anyone here today who's still in that grave, who hasn't reconciled with you, who doesn't know where they stand, who can't worship freely because they're holding something back. Father, I pray you help them to let go today and worship you freely. Father, just be with us as we continue to worship. We pray that you're blessed by our songs and the attitude of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, we've entered the month of November, and a lot of our thoughts uh, start going to the holidays and particularly in this month Thanksgiving a lot of the ladies traditionally think about already thinking about what am I going to fix for Thanksgiving dinner who all's coming to my house what's the stuff we're going to do and yet this year it's because of the pandemic things are just a little different I want to teach you a fairly new Thanksgiving carol Thanksgiving song that I found uh, last year uh, that really for me sp speaks a lot it's not a flashy song but the lyrics are rich and deep. So as we learn it this month, I hope and pray that it'll begin to mean something to you and direct your thinking to the things that we really need to be thankful for. So this song is called My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness, and I'm going to invite you to stand and learn it as we sing it together. <laughs> 
Man, if you're not excited right now, there's something wrong with you. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that God inhabits the praises of his people. And so just being together like this corporately and singing together and worshiping together, God promises that we experience his presence. Now, his presence lives in us, but there's just something about when, when the church comes together and we sing, we we lift up our praises to the Lord. That God gives us a promise that he inhabits the praises of his people. Now, let me tell you, get your Bible, open it to Hebrews chapter 10. And, and let me just tell you how God is working because when you get to chapter 10, you're in essence in the book of Hebrews standing on top of the mountain. And I, I couldn't help but think as we were singing from the very beginning of this service that that God was moving us to the top of a mountain. And when you're studying the book of Hebrews, when you get to chapter 10, that's really the pinnacle. Next week when we look at chapter 11 and 12 and 13 and the weeks to come, it, it kind of is different than what we've been looking for in these first 10 chapters. But I, I truly believe that God has a word for us this morning. Now, let me just tell you this. You might not feel like you're on top of a mountain this morning. Now, I hope that through this worship, it has transformed you and gotten your mind and your eyes fixed on the Lord. That's the great thing about, about worship that God blesses us with is that we benefit. Now, we do it for his glory. We benefit because it just transforms our heart. We get our mind and our eyes focused on the Lord. But I know this has been a tough week. Some of you maybe have have experienced things that have happened this week, and maybe you just feel like uh, you're in a valley. Maybe you don't feel like you're on some mountaintop this morning. Maybe you're in a hole. The Bible says, pity the man that falls in a hole, and no one's there to pick him up. So we know that life is full of holes. Life is full of valleys. Life's not all mountaintops. But I tell you what God's Word does. When we open the Bible, and we look at His truth, what God does is take his word and accomplish in us what this Bible intends to accomplish, and that is to get our eyes on Christ. You start looking at your world around you, looking at your circumstances and all the things that go on, you'll find yourself in a hole. You'll find yourself in a valley. But God's able to take us to a mountaintop when we see him in this Bible. And he reveals who he is to us. So, I want you to stop right now. Maybe your heart is so full of worship just in singing and lifting up these praises. But let's ask God to speak to us this morning. Maybe there is someone here that you just have to be honest. Man, I'm in that valley, Pastor. Or maybe I stepped in a hole this week. And it's pretty dark in that hole. God wants to speak to all of us this morning. So let's pray. Lord, Thank you that you are our solid rock. And we can sing praises about you and sing praises to you. Lord, I thank you for, for who you are. That you're a God that has chosen to reveal yourself to us by sending your son Jesus to live on this earth a sinless, perfect life, and yet give his life on the cross as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. 
And Lord, I thank you for your word this morning that you've given us that we can open and know that you desire to speak to each and every one of us. So Lord, whether we're on a mountaintop or whether we're in a valley or in a hole, Lord, use your word this morning to accomplish your purpose in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you got your Bible open to Hebrews chapter 10, I, I want to kind of lay this chapter out. And this is a long chapter. It's 39 verses here. Next week, <laughs> we'll, we'll come across the largest, longest chapter in the book of Hebrews. It's 40 verses. This one, just 39. But I'm not going to read all of them this morning. But I want to tell you how the, the chapter is broken up. It, it really, as a whole, if you read all of chapter 10 of Hebrews, it's, it's a picture. It, it's a picture of salvation. And really, that picture began back in chapter 1 as we started looking back in the Old Testament and seeing that, that picture form. And, and then you get through the the, the first nine chapters, you get to chapter 10, and you've got a full picture of our salvation. And here's how it's laid out. you got, you got past salvation, present salvation, and future salvation. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, if you were given your testimony, if you're going to share your story, you would start it with when your, your spiritual life began. In fact, you would even go back 2,000 years earlier when Jesus died on the cross because that's truly where your spiritual life began. When Jesus died, he made a way for you to have your sins forgiven. And so when you trusted him as your Lord and Savior, that became your past salvation. That became the, the salvation that began in your life. But then you move to the present. Now that you're saved, this is, this is your life in Christ. And then you move from there to a future salvation, which we know is what God has promised us when we'll be with him for all eternity. Hebrews chapter 10 is laid out just that way. So when you get to verse 1, really the first 18 verses deal with our past salvation. There's the longest section that we're going to look at. The other two are not quite as long, but here he covers a lot of territory here. Looking back, at where our salvation began. Notice what he says in verse 1. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. Now again, from chapter 1 all the way up to this point, it has been showing us from the Old Testament that it is just a picture. It's, it's not what God gave to satisfy the children of Israel never experienced what it was like to be, to be totally forgiven. The old covenant that they were given was simply a picture of what was to come. I, I, some of you heard me mention my, uh, my mom. She, uh, she was a, a school teacher for th almost 30 years. She taught home economics, and, uh, and she taught girls. I, I'll never forget uh, the year she came, uh, the, the day she came home from school is I think it was like April or May, her principal had came to her room and said, Miss Deal, uh, I hate to inform you, but next year in home ec, you're going to have to take boys. My mom resigned. <laughs> she did. She quit. She told him, she said, I can't do it. She said, I've taught girls all my career, and she said, that's my curriculum, that's, that's just what I do. I can't handle boys in this class. Well, it was the new day, and boys were supposed to be given, you know, opportunities to, to take a class like home economics. But what my mom did for all those years in teaching home ec, her main focus was cooking. She would teach girls how to cook. Now, she taught other things in, in home economics, but that was her big thing. And my mom would collect cookbooks, and, and she would use those cookbooks as curriculum and helping the girls, you know, know how to take a recipe and, and make these different things. And she had people sending her cookbooks. We had cookbooks all over. And I remember looking at those cookbooks because they had great pictures in them. <laughs> I mean, I, I learned to love food just by looking at the pictures. They would have all these pictures of the things that the recipe, you know, said that, that this is what it would be and this is how it would look. But you know what? I never, I never looked at one of those cookbooks and went, Man, I'm full now. 
No. Those cookbooks and those pictures were simply to help me to long for what those pictures represented. That's how you read the Old Testament. That's what he's saying here. The Old Covenant was meant to be a picture of what was about to come. So notice what he says there in verse 1. He says the sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year. Sounds like chapter 9, doesn't it? But they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified, now get this, once for all time. Once for all time. Now, Last week in chapter 9, three times the author says, once for all time. Jesus' sacrifice was once for all time. Him dying on the cross was once for all time. Here he's going to say it three times again. Notice down in verse 10. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. He'll say it again in verse 12. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. You get the point. Looking back of what Jesus did on the cross, the main point that is need to be made is that what Jesus did was once for all time. He says, and their feelings, go back to verse 2, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. Verse 3, but instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. And here's a classic verse, verse 4. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It was just a picture of what Jesus would do when he died on the cross. All those sacrifices those hundreds and thousands of lambs every year at Passover and the sacrifices that were made all throughout the year over and over and over were always meant to be just a picture. They never would provide permanent, lasting forgiveness. You go down to, to verse 16 and you see the, the new covenant. He draws attention to this new covenant. Verse 16, this is the new covenant I will make my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Verse 17, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. That is salvation past. That's where salvation began. If you're sharing your testimony, if you're, if you're giving your story, you would begin at that point. You would help people to understand how you got saved by going back 2,000 years in the past and saying, when Jesus died on the cross, he took my place. I should have been dying on the cross. I was guilty of sin. And what Jesus did was substituted. He substituted himself for me. That's salvation past. Now, he moves to salvation present. In verse 19, really all the way down to verse 25, he covers, okay, now that you're saved, now that you've established that you've, you've trusted in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, you couldn't save yourself. Once and for all, he sacrificed for you. Now this is how you live the Christian life. Notice what he says, verse 19. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Christ. Now, that's the, not the first time you've seen that. In chapter 4, verse 16, he talked about entering boldly into the presence of God. Here he says it again. This is how we are to live our life. Boldly, we can enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Christ. Verse 20, by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. One of the most, most amazing things to the Jews that were receiving this letter was for hundreds and hundreds of years, they could never get beyond that curtain. Now the curtain was ripped, and they could go into the very presence of God. Now that holy of holies, that area, was just symbolic. It wasn't that that was God's home. I mean, God was, God was omnipresent. He is everywhere all the time. 
but it was a great symbol that that curtain represented sin that would separate us from God. So how do we live now? Our sins have been forgiven. They've been removed. And now I can experience what it's like to have Christ's presence with me. Now, we know that that's through the Holy Spirit. We now have Christ's Spirit living in us. And so he says in verse 21, And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, he's going to give four instructions here, four commands. They all begin with, let us. Verse 22, verse 23, verse 24, and verse 25. These are instructions on how to live the Christian life. Listen, there are no options when it comes to living the Christian life. When you're saved, you don't have the freedom just to live any way you choose. Now, there's a lot of people today that would say to you, they're a Christian, but their life doesn't line up with Scripture at all. And we can't tell if if Jesus is in somebody's heart. I don't have the ability, nor do you. All we have is is what we see of how a person has lined their life up with Scripture. The Bible gives us commands. Listen, these four are not suggestions. They're not just things that we're to think about. Let us is a command. It's it's a direct instruction on how we are to live our life. Look what he says, verse 22. Here's the first one. Let us go right into the presence of God. Now, again, you understand what that means. I've referred to it a little earlier, but we now have God's presence in us. We don't go somewhere to meet God. (laughs) He's right here. The moment you accepted Christ as your Savior, He came in to live with you in the person of the Holy Spirit, fully God living in you in the form of God's Holy Spirit. That's pretty amazing. That means that that here's an instruction on how we're to live. We're to live knowing that God's presence is always with me. Now, I was taught that as an early age, that when I would go to school or when I would go out on a Friday night, my mom would always remind me, you know God's with you. God's watching everything you do. (laughs) He lives in you. He knows what you're saying. He knows what you're doing. We might not. But God does. That's to make me so mad. (laughs) Because you can't get away from him. If you're a Christian, his presence is there. Look what it says. Let's go right into the presence of God. You live your Christian life in God's presence. But now notice what he says here. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts. Your relationship with God is a relationship that begins in the heart. That's God's greatest work in us, is to change our heart. If he can get our hearts, he can change our actions. But if you're trying to change your actions without letting God change your heart, that's called religion, and it never works. You burn out. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts. Notice this, fully trusting him. Now, that sounds like salvation past. That sounds like what you did when you became a Christian. You fully trusted him as your Savior. That's how your life began. Well, guess what? That's how your life is to continue. We are to be fully trusting God. And let me tell you what, that gets tested a lot. How many of you this week have had your faith tested? Maybe the question has come, Are you trusting man or are you trusting God? Where's your trust? Here it says, hey, this is a command. We're to fully trust God. You did when you became a Christian, and that's how you're supposed to live. In fact, next week when we get to Hebrews 11, (laughs) we're going to look at all these great examples of men of faith in the Old Testament. So he says, let us Go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. And then he goes back into chapter 9, two verses that, that Greg read this morning. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Look at verse 23. Here's the second command, not a suggestion. Let us, let us hold tightly. Your Bible might say hold fast without wavering to the hope we affirm. Now, what's the hope we affirm? 
It's the gospel. That's how you got saved. You put your hope and trust that what Jesus did on the cross was sufficient, and you hoped in trusting him he would forgive you. So it says here, hold tightly to that without wavering, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. So how are we to live with the gospel being central? So what's the gospel telling us? We're forgiven. We're forgiven. Our sins have been removed. How many times a day you need to hear that? <laughs> I need to hear it a lot. Because Satan's, he can't steal our heart, but boy, he can, our soul, he can steal our joy. He can beat you up and make your sins to where you feel so guilty. And God says, nope, I've removed them. I died on the cross for those sins. That's why he says here, hold fast, hold tightly, without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Here's the third command. Verse 24, let us, not a suggestion, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of good love, or to acts of love and good works. Think of ways to motivate. Your Bible might say stir up. Think about that for a minute. In fact, let me ask you this question. Who inspires you to live your Christian life? I mean, who's, whose example are you following? You say, well, I've just followed Jesus, Pastor. Then what are you going to do with verse 24? <laughs> this is a command. We're to think of ways to motivate one another to acts of, good, uh, acts of love and good works. And, and there's two parts to that. One, we should be inspiring someone and we should be following someone that inspires us. God wants us to benefit both ways. Let me go back to my question. Who's inspiring you? Whose example are you following? Who has God placed in your life that you can look to and go, man, I get so much motivation. I get so much inspiration from this person. This past week, we, uh, I had a meeting with pastors in this area. We do it once a month where where on a Thursday, the first Thursday of the month, the pastors in this area, all denominations, we just meet together and pray. And we've been meeting in Worship Center One, this little room right over here. We met this past Thursday. And it's just a good time. We just come together as pastors and, and pray for our churches and pray for each other. I love those Thursdays because there's a guy that shows up that inspires me. Some of you know who he is. His name's Dewey Hickey. He's 82 years old. He's still pastoring Westwood. He's still got as much fire and passion. He ain't got but one arm. I mean, the guy's amazing to me. I told him Thursday, I said, Dewey, I said, you inspire me by the way you're finishing strong. I want to I wanna be that way. I don't want to quit. I want to have that same desire. I mean, he, he prays for his church. He's, he's poured his life into those people. I mean, I look to him, and he's that motivation that I need. How about you? Who, you? who are you watching? Now, let me flip that. Who's watching you? I can assure you that somebody is watching you. Somebody is listening to you. You're an influence on somebody. The Bible says here, hey, you need to be a, a, an inspiration. You need to motivate. You need to stir up. I, that's a command. Notice the fourth one here, verse 25. And let us, not an option, not a suggestion, a command, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. Now, let me just stop there. We're in a pandemic. There's people that, that I know haven't been to worship in months. I, every week, I come across, especially our senior adults, and calling them or talking to them, I come across one of them that, that hasn't been to worship. I had a lady come in our office this week, and she hadn't been to worship since March when we shut down. And, and she just cried in the front office, just telling us, how much she misses coming to worship. She comes to this service. She said, I miss my life group. 
She said, I, I, just, I just feel like I'm drying up. And I sit and listen to her, my heart broke. But I know in verse 25, this is a command, which means that she's not able to because the doctors have told her and her husband both, listen, probably because of your health, the best decision would be to stay away from large crowds. I get that. I understand that totally. But I saw in her heart that day this desire. Where did the desire come from? God put it in her heart. Listen, this is, this is a, a command that we're not to forsake the gathering. And so when we can't because of sickness or, or because of a pandemic, what should our reaction be? Man, we, we hurt. We long to be together because God put that, that command on our heart. You know, when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, do you have to go to church to be a Christian? Please answer, no, you don't have to be a, go to church to become a Christian. But if you are a Christian, if you've genuinely been born again, you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, you're, you're in the new covenant, you have this command in your heart. So you have a desire inside. I, I tell you, here, here's, here's my fear. I, there's a lot of people that haven't been back to church. And, and I know that, that in our flesh, it, it can get, tempting just to kind of do your thing on Sunday. I, I remember the first Sunday that we had called off church. We, we shut down. No church was meeting. I remember coming back to staff the next week and, and going, man, that was different. Yeah, I, I was in my pajamas all Sunday morning. <laughs> you know, we just sat around. We, we ate lunch at our house at 1130 that day. Go figure that. And, you know, I thought, okay, this this, I could get used to this. And, and I kept hearing people go, Pastor, I, you know, I, I kind of have gotten used to this watching online. You know, I mean, we just kind of sit in our living room and we, we just kind of meet together or I, I just kind of watch, the, you know, the service and I, I just enjoy it. I got my coffee. It's just, I just like that. And there's nothing sinful for that. There's people right now that are watching this service uh, live stream online. And I'm, I'm glad you've joined with us. And I know that there's people that watch it because that, that's the way they're connecting, and I'm so grateful for that. But what do you do with verse 25? This is a command. Let us not neglect our meeting together. It's okay to connect when you can't come, you're not able to come, but you gotta get back to this command. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. Why? Here it is but encourage one another. I mean, sitting at home, watching live stream, watching a, a video, listening on the radio, those are good ways for you to, to be fed. But there's not a whole lot of encouraging others. I mean, he starts in verse 24 by introducing this one another. In verse 24, he, he says it again in verse 25, but encourage one one another. And we've talked in here before about how all the one another passages are in there because that was God's design. He didn't design Christians to live independently of one another. He designed us to live in community. And that's not an option. Church is not an option for us. I'm a Christian. I don't have to come to church. To be a Christian, no, you don't. You accept Christ believing that he died on the cross for your sins. But as a Christian, it's a command. Maybe if you got another way of reading this and interpreting this, I'm sure open. But I read it pretty simple. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. But encourage one another. If you didn't have encourage one another on there, you possibly could say, hey, Internet church is okay. You know, because you're meeting together. You're just doing it online. But what do you do with the next verse or next phrase? But encourage one another. Me watching online encourages me. But you sitting here in this worship center, you're in a life group. You're, you're connecting with people around you. That's where we encourage one another. Verse 26. Verse 26 <laughs> It, he kind of changes right here. He's dealt with our salvation past. He just dealt with our salvation present. And before he gets to salvation future, our future salvation, he gives a warning. Now, that's not new to Hebrews. 
If you, if you remember along the way, there were several warnings that the author gives uh, in this book of Hebrews. But when you get to verse 26 in Hebrews 10, it's, it's the most serious warning that he gives. In fact, I would say this. Of all the warnings in the Bible, this next warning right here is one of the most serious warnings. Notice what he says, verse 26. Dear friends, now he's changing the audience here. If you go down and look at verse 19, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, he's talking to Jews that had accepted Christ, Jews that were saved. Verse 26, he changes. Dear friends, he's talking to Jews that have heard the gospel but didn't accept Christ, rejected Christ as the Messiah. So he says, dear friends, dear fellow Jews, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth. Now, let me just stop there. When we accept Christ, we continue to sin. So make sure that you don't misinterpret this. I'm going to make sure that I pray that you get the right interpretation here. So he says, if we deliberately continue sinning, after we have received the knowledge. Now, receive the knowledge is not an indicator that a person was saved. You can receive the knowledge of the gospel without being saved. You can come here and, on Sunday morning and hear the gospel, hear a presentation of the gospel, and not be saved. You receive knowledge, but you just didn't get saved. So he says, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have heard the gospel, we've heard the message of the cross, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. Whoa, what does that mean? Well, it means there's no plan B. <laughs> if you were to talk to somebody this week and say, hey, listen, I, I want to tell you the good news. I want to share with you about what Jesus did for you on the cross. And you lay out the whole gospel. And they say, well, you know, that sounds good, but I'm going to check out some other religions too. You know, I want to see what the Muslims believe. I want to see what Hindus believe. I, I want to see what what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. I, I want to I check out some other religions. Jesus made it clear he is the way, the truth, the life. No man can come to the Father except through Christ. And so what he's saying here in verse 26, it, once you reject the gospel, once you say, no, I'm not interested, there's nothing else. There's no other way for you to have your sins forgiven. Only Jesus on the cross can do it. Look what he says in verse 27. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. That's a pretty strong warning. And I would just say this, since we're talking about testimonies here, if you're sharing your testimony, I, I believe in, in your, your sharing the plan of salvation through your testimony, which I think always, if you're sharing your testimony about how you, you were saved, you always give glory to God by sharing with you how it happened, how Jesus died on the cross for your sins. But one of the things that we sometimes leave out of that gospel presentation is the reason why we became a Christian to begin with. Why? So we'd have a good life, so, you know, things would be a, a lot better for us? No, because we're in line to receive his punishment. If I don't have forgiveness of my sins, if my sins are not removed, I'm going to be judged for my sins. And verse 27 just explains it. There's only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. Now, I don't want to get into this, but I, I can't just overlook this. Look at verse 29. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God mercy to us. Now, that's a long sentence. But notice what he says at the beginning, verse 29. Just think how much worse worse the punishment will be. Now, again, I don't want to go far in this, but I want to make this statement because if you read this or have read reading this, you're just saying, what does that mean? I believe the Bible is clear on this point that there will be degrees of punishment in hell. For someone that's heard the gospel over and over, had access to the gospel, had a Bible, had preaching, had teaching, and rejected Christ, the punishment in hell for this person will be much worse than the person who's living in Africa 
who doesn't have a Bible, doesn't have a church, never heard the gospel. Now, we know that Romans 1 says that person has the knowledge of God that's been written in his heart and that he has turned away from God. So he won't be in hell and go, why am I here? No, you've rejected God. But that person, the Bible says, won't have near the punishment that someone that sat in church all their life, heard the gospel over and over, lived in America where you have access to Bibles and you have access to teaching. Now again, I, I don't want to go long in that, but I, I, I didn't want to just brush right over that. Go down to verse 31. He closes this warning up with this statement. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. You need that. We all need to know that. It's a terrible thing. When you're witnessing to somebody, that's a great verse to quote. It's not a good thing to die and stand before God someday. Go down to verse 35. He's going to go right, well, really verse 34. He's going to go right to this last part of the picture of salvation, which is future salvation. Verse 34, you suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when, all you, and when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew, get this, there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. Future salvation. Verse 35, so don't throw away this confidence, trust in the Lord. Future salvation, remember the great reward it brings you. Verse 36, Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Future salvation, then you will receive all that he has promised. Verse 37, future salvation here. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith. That's chapter 11 next week. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. Here's the last statement of future salvation. We are the faithful ones, get this, whose souls will be saved. Whose souls will be saved? I thought we were saved when we asked Jesus to come into our heart. You were. You, you've got salvation past, which is when you first accepted Christ. That goes back 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. You got salvation present. Jesus lives in your heart. You are, have access to him. But we have salvation future. This body that we live in now, <laughs> not going to last for eternity. <laughs> Thank goodness. And we're going to die, and it's going to be put in the ground, and it's going to rot and decay. Our souls will go to be with the Lord. And the Bible says when the rapture occurs, the dead in Christ, those that have died, whose souls have already gone to be with the Lord, are now going to be united with a brand new body. That's glorification. That's the final part of our salvation. And together we will be with the Lord. Let me close with this. Last week, my wife and I, I think it was Sunday evening, watched a movie. We had seen this movie before, but we saw it on television thought, man, let's watch this again. It, it's the movie I can only imagine. Some of you maybe have seen this movie. It's based on a true story. Uh, Bart Millard, who helped form the Christian band Mercy Me. It, it's his story. Uh, he, he grew up in a very abusive home. His father was an alcoholic, very abusive. And uh, it, his mom and dad divorced when he was a, it was a kid growing up. And and so he, he moves away, and during that time, his father gets saved. This is all in this movie. His father gets saved and really turns his life around. But his dad gets cancer, and, uh, and he dies. And so Bart, after his funeral, sat down, and he wrote this song called, I Can Only Imagine. It was back, I think, 2001, 2002. It became the number one Christian single. In fact, today, it is the most listened Christian song ever. I can only imagine. When it first came out, I'll never forget when I first heard it. 
We had a funeral here at our church. It was a little boy in our church named Peyton. He had cancer, and uh, our whole town was praying for him. I mean, school was praying for him, and, and our church was praying for him. He'd been at Little Rock Children's and back and forth. I'd visited him several times, and he just got worse and worse, and, and he died. And I remember sitting with his mom, and we were talking about the funeral service, and she said, Ronnie, can we play the song at his funeral, I Can Only Imagine? I went, sure. I, mean, I didn't know the song, never heard it. It hadn't been out long. And I remember sitting up here on the day of his funeral. This place was packed. And they played that song. And as I sat and listened to the lyrics of that song, it just took me face to face with what heaven is going to be like. I, I want to close with just reading to you the lyrics. Listen to what it says. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. And he closes the song this way. I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever forever worship you. That is our future salvation. And that is the mountaintop on Hebrews chapter 10. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your love for us. We don't deserve it. We've done nothing to earn it. But Lord, your word tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, I thank you for Hebrews and just standing on the top of the mountain on chapter 10. Thank you for our past salvation that happened when you died on the cross for the pictures in the Old Testament that point to your sacrifice once for all. Lord, thank you for the instruction. We don't have to guess how we're to live for you. Thank you that now we have access. We can come into your presence, live that way, Lord, that we can be reminded of the promise you made to us through the gospel that we are forgiven. Our sins have been removed. Lord, help us today as we connect with others to be an inspiration, to motivate, to inspire by our example. And Lord, I pray that you'll put people in our life that we can look to and follow the example that they're leaving for us. Lord, help us to realize the command that you want us to meet together so we can encourage one another. Lord, I thank you so much that we can only imagine what it will be like when we're with you face to face and forever, forever worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we're dismissed, if there's somebody here this morning 
and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. I've read that verse there in chapter 10 of the warning. You've heard the gospel today. I plead with you in behalf of, of God's word to trust him as your Savior. Don't reject him. There is no plan B. There is no other way to get to heaven. If you're searching for another way, you'll be lied to because the truth is what Jesus has done for us. If you need help, if you need somebody to pray with, just have some questions, please let us know. That's, that's the desire of our heart is to help people to connect with the Lord. If you're a Christian, enjoy the mountaintop. See you next Sunday.